a pastor has got to tell them he saved the best for last. <laughs> In a brief testimony, most of you know me. Some of you don't. After you hear me preach, you might not want to know me. But uh, I'm your choice for the night, and uh, I'm surprised. Bitter cold outside. I told my wife, we're not going to have more than 25 people. Well, I think there's 26, so that's pretty good. <laughs> but this is a special night to me. 52 years ago tonight, midnight watch night service, Rivermont Baptist Church, 1965, I preached my first sermon, and I ain't looked back since. 52 years of telling people about the Lord. They say that my wife and I's legacy in Franklin County, where we started and pastored the church for 30 years, is all the property all the buildings, and it's a beautiful location, beautiful piece of property, but that's not our legacy. Our legacy is those that we've been able to win to Jesus. After I preached that sermon, Jerry Young, my pastor, said, you got five minutes. I, I never thought that five minutes would pass. I started preaching, and I just looked at the clock. Now, forget it. I don't look at the clock anymore. I just go down, done, okay? And uh, since how we're going into the new year, I should be finished about 5 till 12. Didn't get a single amen. Did I turn this thing on, Pastor? No. Wait a minute, folks. I, I can't get it. You want to turn it on? <laughs> Touch me and heal me, my brother. There you go. Oh, I'm on now. Okay. But uh, Pastor Young came to me. I was 15 years old in one month. And he said, uh, Brother Abbe, how about teaching a Sunday school class? 15 years old. I didn't know how to say no. I was too stupid or too blind. I didn't know which. But I took a second grade class of boys at 15. And for over 50 years, I've taught Sunday school. I've taught every age group. And to be honest with you, as I watch the adults, I'd rather teach the children. I really would. I'd rather <laughs> teach the children. But it's been an interesting journey. And I'm sharing this because you're going to see where I'm going. Some of them told me tonight. We won't mention names, but Billy, uh, she told me I had 15 minutes, and another one said I had 10 minutes. Brian said I had as long as I wanted. He said, you may get up and leave, but just preach till you're done. So that's what I'm planning to do. I figured this out a long time ago. If you can't get it said in 25 or 30 minutes, it ain't going to be said. But uh, I have a lot of regrets of those 52 years. I mean, some of those years I ran from God, ran all the way to Vietnam. And then I came back and I met my wife. We've been married almost 47 years, something like that. We've been married so long that I know she's my wife, so there's no problem, you know. <laughs> she asked me the other day, she said, you don't ever say you love me anymore. I said, sweetheart, I told you on May the 9th, 1971, that I loved you and that if anything changed, that lets you know. <laughs> <laughs> Women. But... God is good to us, and then we pastored. I pastored for 40 years, uh, left a small church in Brookneal. Uh, I go by the name Fundamentalist. But you know, folks, y'all been sitting there for the last 45 minutes. It might be a good idea just to get you not to talk. Now, I know immediately when the knees bend, you do. Let me get you to stand up. That means on your feet. Off your seat and on your feet. And if you're able to get one hand over your head, do it. Or both hands. And say this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, is God is good all the time. All the time. Amen. Amen. Now you can be seated. But it's an anniversary for me. And I thank God I was telling Brother Nathan he's leaving next week for Crown College, and God has called him into the ministry. And all I can say to Nathan publicly is what I've said to him privately. Don't ever look back. Because what's behind you is not near as important as what's in front of you. And that's men and women and boys and girls waiting to hear the word of God, waiting to be saved. If you have your Bible, 2 Timothy tonight, chapter 4. Uh, I'm going to preach to you tonight just for a few minutes. Got three short things. And then we'll go down and have some of that good food. But uh, 
I have preached, I used to think when I first started, man, it's only 66 books, I'll be done preaching in a year and I won't have nothing to preach. <laughs> but I found out. You can preach John 3.16 for the next 52 years and you're not going to get it all said. You know, the Lord is so great you can talk about him all the time. He really is. And so tonight, I, I don't have a leftover for you. I don't have a, a, a remake. I didn't pull one of the sermons and I got about 15,000 of them. I didn't pull a sermon out of my door to say, what can I do? Pastor asked me to bring the message. I went home and prayed and this is what God gave me. If you don't like it, Take it up with him when you leave, all right? But this is what the Lord says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 6 through 8. Paul said, and he's near the end of his journey, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. And if you look over at verse 16 and 17, Paul says these words, he said, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it not be laid to their charge. So you can see he didn't want to get even. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Father in heaven, we thank you tonight, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Lord, for people who have that musical ability that you have given that blesses and stirs and breaks up our fallow hearts. We thank you tonight, Lord, that these people have braved the cold, and didn't stay home because they desire to worship you. And I pray, God, that they have done that in prayer and in song and in giving. Now, Lord, I pray as I share another message, Lord, from your word, that you would hide me behind Calvary, and, Lord, that they would not see me, but they would see you because you're the only one that's worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to share with you what is unrelenting faith. The dictionary describes unrelenting as not yielding or being constant. When we first began years ago, I wondered whether this was what God really called me to do. When we moved to Franklin County from Northern Virginia, I really wondered if God had made a mistake. I really did because uh, I didn't know anybody. Nobody called me there. Our first church building in the summer of 78, we had to sweep the water out after a thunderstorm just to be able to have services. Uh, the power went out one Sunday afternoon. In the summertime, hot. We didn't have air conditioning. And uh, I called one of the church members. I said, I need a lantern. He bought me one of those Coleman pump-up lanterns. We set it on the pulpit, and I preached till the stars came out. People ask us why we went to some place we didn't know. Because God told us to. And those early years were difficult, at the least, to serve God. I can remember the mornings that I stayed on my knees until the dawn broke the sky, crying out to God for souls. Pastor said something last week, it stuck in my mind, and he's absolutely right. He's right once in a while. <laughs> the problem in our Bible-believing churches today is that we've lost our urgency, our compassion to reach the lost. Amen. Give you the proof in the pudding, how many people have you honestly witnessed to this year that was not your family, sure. was not your brother or your sister or your next door neighbor, but somebody that God just laid on your heart. We tried an experiment back here uh, uh, last October when Pastor asked me to fill in and I, I gave uh, eight people an apple apiece and I gave each one of them $10 apiece I said, go out and find a stranger and just give it to him. You know, it's easy to be charitable when we're taking up an offering at the back. Because a lot of times when the offering plate's being taken up at the back, they're going out the back door, okay? That's the way some God's people are. They don't have unrelenting faith. Now, I want to take you to a few verses, if you please. Second, uh, excuse me, Luke 17 and verse 6. And I want you to take your Bibles, if you brought them, 
And if you can't get them in church, you're in trouble. But in Luke 17 in verse 6, and you know the verse, And the Lord said, If you had the faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamore tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Now the teachers that are here tonight know that a, a mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. If you plant it and it grows, it, it, it's some of the biggest tree that you will find. But Jesus said if you had that much faith, you could tell the mountain to be removed. What is mustard seed faith? Do you have it tonight? It is not spectacular faith. Spectacular faith is kind of like a flash in the pan. But mustard seed faith, according to, um, now his name went clean out of my mind. Who started Tennessee Temple? Lee Robinson. Lee Robinson's in heaven now. But Lee Robinson saw a need and read the story in his biography and how he fought his own church in order to get that university started that thousands of young people have gone through over the years and got a Christian education. It really doesn't make any difference what you think of Jerry Falwell. He's in heaven and he don't care. <laughs> but Jerry Falwell had a vision to build a church. So after Bible college in 1954, he went back to his hometown and his home church. Throw him out. So him and 35 other people started what was called Thomas Road Baptist Church. Went on to become one of the super churches of the 70s. In the late 60s, Dr. Falwell had another vision. To build a world-class university. So no matter what you think of Jerry Falwell, if you go to Lynchburg, the first thing you're going to see and the first thing you're going to hear is that world-class university that has been built for the Lamb of God. How was it done? It wasn't done with spectacular faith. It was done with unrelenting faith. He never, ever gave up. How many times did they advise my wife? I'd say they told us, but advise us. My mother said, son, what are you doing? Taking your wife way down there where you don't know nobody. Why don't you just pack up and come home? Well, I said, Mom, as soon as God tells me to do that, I'm going to do it. He ain't told me to do it yet, and Mom's in heaven. If you want to take a short trip to Rocky Mount and, and go west of town and find the Lighthouse Baptist Church, that is not Bob Andrews. That's the Lamb of God because God honored our unrelenting faith. I know what it's like to eat soup beans for 365 days a week. I know what it's like to eat spaghetti without the sauce. I know what it's like to give my last penny away and wait for God to open the door. I think I told somebody here a couple of weeks ago that I found this out. God's shovel's always bigger than mine. God called me to serve him, and all I got to do is serve him. It's his job to take care of me. And as you can see, he's doing a pretty good job. And if you can't see it, Meet me down in the fellowship and I'll show you just how good it is. <laughs> My wife's made some delicious hot potato soup. Uh, oh, it, it, yeah, it'll make your tongue slap your brains out. <laughs> we know what that's like. Somebody asked me the other day, said, How are you doing financially, preacher? I said, The same as always. Said, Oh, poor? You still poor? <laughs> Folks, do you know I make more money today than I ever made pastoring? Some of those Christians that we pastored took literally what they were telling each other. God, you keep him humble, and we'll keep him poor. <laughs> but I'm still taking unrelenting faith. Some of us are so dogmatic, so legalistic, that we don't lean one way or the other from these verses. Now, I don't use... Uh, concordance and that type of thing like I used to. But I can tell you this. If you just open your Bible and before you open your big mouth, just God, what is it you want me to see? You don't need to be taught by the fundamentalists, the holiness, the Pentecostals, anybody else. You need to be taught by this book. 
we heard Brian this morning talk about the coming of Jesus Christ. And I kind of looked around, and people had this weird look on their faces. You know why? Because we don't hear about his coming anymore. Whether we hear about it or not, he's coming. I, I say whether we hear or not, he's coming. Thank you. He's coming whether you want him or not. I preached a sermon one time. Get ready. Look out. He's coming whether you're looking for him or not. He's coming. I've looked for him all my life. He has not come yet. I sat by the bedside of dying saints and said, I thought he would come before I died. One of them was 98 years old and loved God. He didn't come. I preached about him coming for 52 years. He hasn't come. But he promised that he would come. And God cannot lie. Titus 1 and verse 3. It's impossible for God to lie. So I don't take my theology. I'm a Liberty graduate from way back. I was a graduate before they ever had the mountain. That was about the time of Noah, I think. <laughs> I got a little bit of Bible education. I went out. I knew what God wanted me to do, and I started a church, and I stayed with them. But I didn't stay because I had spectacular faith. I stayed because I had unrelenting faith. I was bound and determined I wasn't going to quit. And I'm not going to quit now. Do you miss pastoring? No. I found out that about half of God's people are belly aches and the others are belly aching because they're belly aching. <laughs> Where's the praise to God anymore? We came out this morning, oh God, it's cold. And it is cold. And I don't like cold. And I don't like the wind when it's cold. I like hot weather. But God's in charge of it. Tell him to turn the heat up. We fuss about everything. We complain about everything. And so we stayed. We had that unrelenting faith. We saw hundreds of people get saved. Back in the early 90s, this was in Rocky Mount before it got to be a big town. It ain't a big town now. We used to have what they called soul winning. And we'd invite people to come and go soul winning with us every Monday night. Not every other month. Every Monday night, soul winning. And we averaged in those early 90s 35 people every Monday night in a church that was running about 125 people. You take that seat, you take that seat. You don't know how to soul win? Go with him. Go with her. We divided them all up. And as long as we did what God told us to do, the church grew. I've given my testimony here before. I'm not going to take the time tonight. The main thing that drew us here after I retired from pastoring, other than Brian, is it's a mission church. See, we believe in giving to missions. I think Brother Wayne told me we've already gotten enough money for, through the, for the Gideons for 365 battles. There's people all over the world that are waiting for this. I just laid up my ninth Bible. Wow. out. I'm not bragging. If you can't, if this is not your favorite book, you better get right with God. Most of you miss reading it except when pastor says, turn to such and such and please stand. And, and after he's read the scripture and said the last amen, you're still looking for where he was at. <laughs> One of the things I taught our young boys in Sunday school all those years ago, and I didn't know, I said, I'm going to challenge you to memorize the books of the Bible. And they looked at me, second grade boys, do you know them? Uh, well, no. Then we challenge you to learn them with us. So at 15, I learned the books of the Bible, where they are, what they say, what God says, unrelenting faith. Listen, I didn't come to this church to be your best friend. I came to this church to learn about my God and to go out those doors and tell people about my God based on what the book says. Not on how I was brought up. And I was a bus kid. Now, a bus kid, if you don't know what a bus kid is, some of them are right down mean. Back in the 60s, you weren't mean because your mother beat the daylight out of you. My brother one time said, I'm going to call the law on you. Mom said, come here, son. Let me give you something to call the law about. <laughs> Never threaten my mother again. Today, the child rules the home. There's no discipline. You might... You might damage that child if you spank him. Well, the book says, use the rod. 
The word of God, the old King James says beat. Now, we don't like that. Some of you kids better cover your ears up. Beat the child and drive it far from him. The last time I got a whipping was because I was smart-mouthing my mother. My mom raised five sons. And my mom said, if you don't shut up, I'll knock you in the middle of next week. What's the middle of next week look like, Mama? I found out and I never asked her again, ever. <laughs> but those years that the problems mounted on us, the, the months that would go by and nobody would get saved and we'd just keep preaching. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Now, I, I didn't preach. The biggest church I ever preached in was Thomas Road. But most of my pastoring was in small mountain churches in Floyd, Montgomery, Carroll, wherever, in the small churches. I used to ask God, let me pastor a big church, but you know what I figured out? He needs preachers in small churches too. I had some evangelists up in Floyd, some pastors, bring me up for the week, work me all day like I was a mule, and then get me to preach. I've been in the black churches. You ain't worshiped till you've been in a black church. And preach my heart out and get done, sit down. And they get up and sing a song. Come on, brother Andrews. Where are we going? You're going to preach again and again and again. These people don't know when to quit. That's why they only have one service. It starts at sun up and it's sundown. They're done. We Christians, man, we're out the door at 1130. We got to get out of here. We've lost our compassion. If you can go to church and you don't go to church, don't tell me you have compassion for the Lamb of God. The world has told you you only need one hour, 11 o'clock. Word of God says, forsake not the assembly. If the pastor calls Sunday school, you ought to be in Sunday school. Oh, me or amen. If he calls for Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival meetings, whatever God's like, if we're able to be here, this is the place we ought to be. This is the highlight of my week. Not the preaching, but to be in the house of God. Now, I'm different, and you folks know I'm different. Go ahead and say amen. Thank you. I don't understand something. I asked my wife the other day, and she just laughed. Now, this lady has met me. I listened to her singing. Listen to these folks sing. She'll meet me tomorrow, and here's what she'll say. Are you behaving yourself? <laughs> I only got to meet somebody one time, and they think I'm a, you know, <laughs> I ain't your normal preacher, I can tell you that. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> A small amount of faith in God will grow. Just a little seed. It's unrelenting. On. You know why we keep going and we keep going? We're even better than that Energizer Bunny. You know why? Because we love the Lord. I may be getting near the end. I have no idea. Then God might bless you and let me stay around 25 more years at this church. Anybody want to say amen to that? Well, I'll just stay around 25 years, not necessarily with you people. <laughs> and it'll produce major results for God. If you just plant that one little seed and say, I'm not going to quit, God did not call me to quit. All I can say to Nathan is he heads off for Crown College. He's been called to preach. Never step down to take any other job. But just keep on going. Mom and dad are going to miss him. Brother, were you missing brother? Yeah, probably. <laughs> but he's got the greatest calling in the world. And what if the Lord tarries and pastor stands here in 30 years and says, 52 years ago I began and I'm still ticking. I'm still going. I'm still trying to serve the Lord. 1 Timothy 1.5 says that we're to have unfeigned faith. It means don't hide your light from others. Where is your light? And where is your faith shining? Do people see Christ in you? Can they really see the Lord? And I don't see anywhere in the old King James Version, my version, I don't see anywhere where God said I couldn't smile when I went to church. There's these, these folks are singing, and I didn't know Brian could play the banjo. I, I mean, when I get to heaven, I want whoever's in charge of the musicians to teach me how to play some of these. I love it. And you notice they didn't ask me to sing tonight? <laughs> There's a reason for that. 
I'm called to preach. There they go again with them amens. I'm called to preach. I'm not called to sing. But now, I will sing. I have to encourage my wife. Now, you folks kind of laugh and say, oh, you ought to say, my wife cannot sing. She can't sing in the choir. She can't sing in her sleep. She can't sing. As far as you're concerned. But the Word of God says, make a joyful noise. and say, honey, all you got to do is open your mouth and God will bless everything else. Right. Jump to mouth about everything else. <laughs> she ought to open her mouth and sing praises. Where's your passion? Where's the men of yesteryear that would stand and say there's a burning hell and you're headed for that hell? You're going to, like Jonathan Edwards of the 1730s, sinners in the hands of an angry God, some of you folks are here tonight and you're the finest people God ever put on this earth. The only thing is you don't have Jesus. And if you don't have Jesus tonight, I don't care who you are, what your sex is, or what your denomination, you're going to hell. And God doesn't want you to go to hell. He said he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We don't hear about Jesus coming anymore. We don't hear about men and women dying and going to hell. We don't want that being taught in our Sunday schools and preached in our pulpits. We want to feel good religion. Listen, if you're close to Jesus, you can feel good. And if you ain't close, you better be doing some thinking. Because one day, he's going to look at you and he's going to say, get away from me. I never knew you. I could have known you, but he didn't tell you. You ever been told by God to tell someone about Jesus and you didn't do it? And they died and gone? I pray for my nephew every day. He's going to hell. He's 44 years old. I pray for my best friend. He's a Catholic who lives in Marquette, Michigan. He was my best buddy in Vietnam. He's dying and going to hell. I pray for my next door neighbors that curse worse than any cursing you ever heard. Lost on their way to hell. Me and our friend that we went it from in Brookmill. That close. He said, I'm not close. And I said, Bob, till you get that close, ain't going to do you no good. Well, I, I do the best I can. Ain't good enough. Where's your passion? I heard D.L. Moody, I read in his biography one time, he said this. He said, we got to catch the fish before we clean them. We're always concerned about straightening somebody out. And then we can lead them to Jesus. Lead them to Jesus and let him do the straightening out. They used to tell us years ago, and it was fundamentalist, I was told to go home one day because I didn't have a T-shirt under my white shirt. I wasn't fully dressed. I didn't know what a T-shirt was. And I told my mama she had a call to the preacher. They never told me that anymore. You know what? I don't care how you dress. I just care whether you know Jesus. We sit up here behind these bus kids every Sunday. I notice a lot of you keep moving away from them. There was two of them just a jabbering away this morning while Byron was saying something. And I just tapped them on the shoulder and kind of sternly looked at them and said, if you don't be quiet, we're going out on the porch and you ain't going to like it. You know what? They shut their mouths. What's being said from here is far more important than what you're saying or what you're texting. Somebody say amen. amen. This is, you, you didn't come, if you came to gossip, you can do that at home over the phone. You came to hear the word of God being preached. Having that unrelenting faith, never giving up, unfeigned, don't hide your light. Don't worry about cleaning them. You just get them in the house of God, let the Lord save them, and he'll clean them up. I really believe that. And then finally, if you'll go, and I want you to look at this verse as I close. It's over in James. Find Hebrews. I don't hear no Bible pages. Would you all think you wasn't going to get no preaching tonight? James chapter 2 and verse 14. James talks about people who say they have faith. When I look at you, and not judgmental, but when I look at you, I see if there's anything being produced in your life for God. People used to get so mad at me, they'd tell me they'd never speak to me again. And they lied, they started talking to me again the next Sunday. 
Well, they go out of church and say, Brother Andrew, is that the greatest message I ever heard? And they slept through the whole thing. <laughs> we got a problem today. We, we want people to think we're busy. I shared in October, and I share with you who have never heard me, when I was finishing up in Brookneal, that's below Lynchburg, a little old town, there was a 75-year-old man that came up to me, bald-headed, heavy set, beautiful blue eyes, and a dear friend. And he put his arms around me, and he stepped back, and he took me by the right hand. He had a grip you wouldn't believe. And he said this, Pastor Andrews, because I have known you, I know more about my God. Isn't that what they're supposed to be saying about us every day? We're too busy with the light shining. Look at me. Look what I'm doing for God. The ones who gain the most rewards for God are those who work in the in, in sidelines and nobody ever sees them, nobody ever hears them, and they just unrelenting. They just keep on teaching that class. They just keep on preaching the word of God. They just keep on they're prayer warriors like you wouldn't believe. They know how to get in touch with heaven. Their, their prayers don't go up and hit a brass ceiling and fall back down. They have unrelenting faith. And if I keep this unrelenting faith the Bible talks about, I can say when I get to the end, I fought a good fight. I've run my course. I've done what God told me to do. Jonathan Edwards, who was not a well man, he was the only son of 11 kids, had 10 sisters, and he was one of those who preached seven times a, seven times a day. I can't even imagine. Seven days a week. And he didn't have a Ford to drive, he had a horse. And he would read his sermons and write his notes as he was riding along to the next circuit. And Jonathan Edwards said, I would rather rust out. Well, I would rather burn out than rust out. Now, I got some news for some of you folks tonight. You ain't going to like it. You're rusting out. You know how I can tell? Every time I'm around you, you squawk. And you squeal. And you fuss. And you complain. Now, I know, folks, I'm 67. And I admit it. It ain't no fun getting old. The only thing about getting old, closer to Jesus. The best thing about this year, we're just a little bit closer to getting home. Some of us may be closer than we think. But some of you are just drifting along. This young pastor, Felix, that uh, spoke here a couple of weeks ago, he's got to learn the English language. I didn't pick up about half of what he said. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I mean, I listened to everything, and I had to listen close because he don't talk like y'all do. <laughs> he got a, he got a foreign language. And I gave him some books that I no longer use. I hope he can use them. They were Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. Dr. Wilmington used to be called Mr. Bible at Liberty. And I hope he can use them. And I hope as Felix goes down that road, as Nathan goes down that road, or whoever you are tonight, this young lady that, oh, that was, she can hit the notes. Singing for the glory of God or the guitars, or the banjos, or the singing, the quiet singing, just keeping on. I pray every day for my pastor. You know what I ask him? I don't pray, Lord, give him the message they need. I said, God, keep him from falling. Because all he's got to do is stumble one time. And that's what the world will remember about him. They'll never remember all the good the pastor had. So you need to pray because if he stumbles, Satan's got him. In closing, we want to build a new sanctuary. And we're, we're hoping that we can get it done in the next 52 years. <laughs> We've saved quite a bit of money. And we're asking God to give us more so we can have a place for people to sit and hear the word of God. The only way a new building is going to be built, it ain't going to be built by you people that give a dollar here and a dollar there. Now that's all you got. That's fine. It's going to be built by people who have unrelenting faith. This is a will of God, and we're going to do it if it's the last thing we do. If it's the last thing we do, we're going to do this for God. Unrelenting faith. Can people really see that faith in you? 
when you get to the end of the road, will they say he or she lived for God? It's very easy to criticize the walk, especially if you're not walking it. Billy Sunday once said, he said, invest your life in nothing. Invest your life in nothing that won't last for eternity. That won't last for eternity. So are you just spinning your wheels? Did you come tonight for the refreshments and we want you to stay? I'm behind by 100% on that one. Did you come to hear the music? Did you come to hear the preacher? I was complimented a while ago by some people that are older than I am, so they don't know any better. You'll, you'll get it in a minute. Think about it. And they said, we're never disappointed when you preach. Watch them tell me after church they got disappointed. Well, if you did, you, if you did, you were not listening. I don't plan to quit. Pastor Brian stops preaching the word. He starts compromising. I'll either find another Bible-believing church or just go out and start one. And churches like what we have here are getting less and less and less. If you don't believe it, now if you tell Brian I said this, I'll tell him you lied. Go to some of these churches one Sunday morning and see what you hear. He'd be fired in a second. Because he talks about the blood and preaches Jesus Christ. And so-called churches don't want to hear that today. That's why they're dying or combining their congregations. Because if you, if you don't talk about Jesus and preach Jesus, what do, you, what do you got to talk about? I didn't come. So you'd be happy with me. I come to tell you and urge you tonight, as a living example of the Lord Jesus Christ, 52 years have passed. I have made a mountain of mistakes. There's some casualties that I can look back along the way that I created. But I can also look back at the countless souls that God has saved. Those second grade boys, two of them still serving God full time. One of them's a CIA agent. I said, what are you doing? He's also a pastor. I was up in his territory in Luray a couple of years ago. I said, what do you do as a CIA agent? He said, well, Pastor Andrews, if I tell you that, I'll have to kill you. I said, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> Works for the CIA pastors full time, but still serving God. Still go and remembering all those years ago how you would open the Word of God and for 20 minutes you would explain to us one verse, week after month after year, and they're still serving God. If you're going to be able to say what Paul said, I've run the course, I fought the fight. I'm now ready to be. You don't need spectacular faith. You need unremitting faith. The faith that never, ever quits. Let's pray. Heads